Hey everyone, I'm Amy Skinner and with me today I have a guest I'm very excited about which is Tressa Bolden and she is someone that I admire very much because uh, she has the experience and the skill set that I admire and also really want for myself and so I'm happy to have you here to talk about your experiences and um, all that stuff. So I'll let you explain yourself as you can probably do it better. Okay. Thanks, Amy. Um, I'm Tressa and um, I've been riding since I was five. You know, my dad started putting me on the back of a horse pretty early on, um, probably before that. There's pictures of me as a baby on a horse. And I always had an affinity for horses. Um, but I came up in the industry basically hands on uh, learning from other trainers, um, you know, started out as a young child uh, working with, you know, our 4-H program, um, you know, back in the early 70s. And uh, from there, my love of horses never ceased. So um, without really the support of my parents, I figured out a way to be involved with horses. And that was by becoming a good helper. And so I volunteered at people's barns and got a uh, riding time in exchange. And um, that turned into working for uh, several local trainers in many, many disciplines. You know, I've done everything from English riding was, were, was the root of it all. Um, but back, you know, in the 70s, 80s, you know, you either did English or Western, you know, and you were a hunter jumper rider or, you know, a Western rider. And I did both. Um, I learned how to start colts and I did, uh, you know, in that day, what was considered Western pleasure doesn't even look like the same animal of today. Um, and I learned, uh, basic roping. I rode cutting horses. Um, I did a lot of jumping, um, nothing super competitive because I didn't have the means to do it, but I had, what I got is I got the experience of working for a cutting horse trainer and doing 30 horses of different varieties, everything from, you know, two and three year olds to stallions. Um, I helped with the breeding programs, um, you know, I had responsibilities of tacking up all of those horses. Um, and then, you know, truly, like I fell in love with dressage pretty early on, but it wasn't that common in the area. And one of the first trainers that came here was uh, an Olympic trainer and she had a barn in the area. And at 12, I ended up going and working for her um, and my fascination and love with it never ceased. I, I began pursuing that as more people became available to work with or, or go take a lesson from, I would show up at clinics, I would volunteer, whatever I had to do. So I ended up working for, with several local trainers as a young person. And uh, part of my job was maybe, you know, start getting all the thoroughbreds that they were bringing. Cause at the time that was a big thing. You'd get thoroughbreds off the racetrack that weren't making it as um, race horses and turning them into dressage horses. That was my job. Um, and I loved thoroughbreds. So, um, and then the warm blood showed up. And so I had opportunities to ride different old style Hanoverians, et cetera. And, um, you know, but as I was learning from these trainers, um, I started to recognize, you know, that uh, maybe I wasn't understanding what they were teaching and I wanted to learn something more. Um, I wanted to learn how to be a better communicator with the horse so that I didn't have the struggle and the, the fight of what was happening at that time uh, with horses. You know, I didn't want to... Um, I didn't want to be combative with horses or make them do things. I wanted to learn how to have harmony. So I kept looking for teachers and it really wasn't until my um, early twenties that I, in several different facets, met my mentor, Melissa Sims. And I didn't know who she was. I didn't have any clue about the Egon von Neindorf Institute, except Later, I realized I had run into several pictures and different books and descriptions of his students being 
impeccable with their equitation and very good riders. And then I started to put the dots together. When I first met Melissa, I um, didn't really understand where she was going because everything she was teaching was really the opposite of what I had learned from the various trainers I had ridden with. And, you know, um, at the time I'd been riding with a lot of big name trainers. Um, and it was like, loosen the nose band, you know, uh, get over the horse's center of motion, which maybe means lean forward, you know, which had always been an instinctual thing for me because I'd ridden hot horses um, and you don't want to get left behind. Um, yeah. But I was told to sit really tall and, you know, look a certain way, but it had nothing to do with function. So, so I overrode some of the instincts that I had. So I was hearing this from Melissa and thinking, okay, well, she's crazy because all of the, uh, you know, sport people were telling me to look this way and do these things. And, you know, at the time I had a really, really hot Arabian horse, in fact, that had gone up and over on top of me. And I couldn't find a trainer in the professional realm that knew what to do with him or me. And they were just like, well, why would you ride an Arab? You know, anybody can get an Arab. Well, he, you know, he was a really well-bred Arab. Let's start there. Famous stallion. Um, monogram was his sire. Um, but anyway, the the whole point of that is that it led me to Melissa because she was saying things I'd never heard. Loosen the nose band. Uh, you have to learn to sit better. I thought I knew how to sit. You know, I'd been riding Grand Prix horses and such of these uh you know, uh, famous, uh, dressage people. But, um, so I, I left her clinic thinking, ah, oh, that lady's crazy. <laughs> and then I saw, you know, about six months later, I saw in a magazine called dressage and CT, which isn't, I don't think circulating any longer, but it was, it was a big magazine back then, a whole article written by one of her students with the pictures of her that are quite famous of her on Serafino. Uh, Garrett Hoishman and Klaus Balkenhall used these pictures in their tours of the United States as the example of correct riding. And um, I saw those with an article saying, when, when at a horse show, do you see this? And I saw the pictures. I went, oh my gosh, that's so beautiful. You know, it was, for me, it, it was like, I want to be that person looking so quiet and harmonious and uh, with the horse without any you know, the horse's eye was soft, the horse's body looked full and, and uh, muscular under her. And so I sought her out. And from there's where my story really starts, where I started really learning what horsemanship was about. And uh, so I spent 22 years as Melissa's student. Within that time, I was her assistant for uh, four years when I had talked her into staying here in the in the area. And I found her here, even though she was the Egon von Neindorf Riding Institute, I found her here because she was married to a gentleman that was part of the San Francisco uh, orchestra. And it was actually really close to where I live, uh, wow. which was funny. Yeah. And um, I ended up finding Melissa uh, after I'd called her and not gotten a return call. And I decided I was going to go search for her place. I didn't know where it was, but I had it like inkling of where it was. And I, in fact, pulled up into her driveway the minute she um, came in from the airport from Germany in her little car and was unloading her car. And, uh, you know, she thought I was a bit crazy, but um, <laughs> I was determined to get her attention and to, and to have her accept me as a student. And she did. Wow. So that, that's my story as far as uh, where I came into classical horsemanship. And um, she changed the trajectory of my life with horses for the better and my whole life really. So um, one of the reasons I really wanted to talk to you on this interview is because you have bridged this gap that so many people who have the desire don't make it through that initial uh, discomfort, which is like you described a while ago, you think you have studied something and you've gotten this far and then you come along, there's an image of what you want, but then the way to get it is sort of to unravel everything you already know mm -hmm. and really eat humble pie, right? So <laughs> I think that's an enormous sure. um, hindrance if you can't get through that to 
meeting your your goals. Um, but what what are some things that you think are essential for becoming, as you described, an impeccable rider? Not just a good rider, but like if you really want this, what kind of things do you have to have inside of you, and and then also to get through? Um, I think the first thing that comes to mind is you have to have a really true love for your for horses and as i said i had a, i had a little horse that maybe you know i mean quite actually a big arab he was 15 three polish arab um and he'd been given to me because he was a problem you know with the bit and uh and it was very hot you know i'd ridden a lot of arabs and thoroughbreds and stuff and he he was like riding a cat <laughs> you know but what drove me to find a better teacher was that horse because I wouldn't give up on him. And I had, sorry, such a deep love for him that I knew I had to become a better rider, you know, to, uh, yeah. sorry, I'm going to cry because I love that horse. Um, I had to become a better rider to save his life and to have this relationship I wanted so badly with him, you know? Yeah. And, um, and he was tricky. I mean, I had had, I had one trainer who was a Charles de Comfy student for years and she, she was a, a really good teacher, but um, not very accessible and not, not in the category of what Melissa brought, but she came over to try to help me with this horse and she climbed on him. And the next thing I know, I'm instructing her because, because it was that wild, Mr. Toad's wild. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we got it all under control. No one got hurt, but she looked at me and she goes, if you can train this horse, she goes, you're good. Yeah. That's how refined he was. He took you know, like they say, every master has their horse. Well, I was nowhere near a master, but I had found the horse that was going to teach me uh, not only how to find the right teacher, but yeah. um, how to persevere through something that was quite difficult. Yeah. And so, yeah. So first off, the love, love of horses and to want to do right by them and to want to have, um, a relationship with them, not just make them do something that's on your agenda, but to listen to the horse, you know, and follow that. And um, I think it's rare in this day because we all, uh, you know, I think we're in society, we want to climb somewhere, but things have become too um, on the surface, superficial, yeah. the, the gratification of of something needs to be quick and flashy and look like something, but yeah, rarely is it that people are understanding what it takes to develop substance, you know? Yeah. And, and um, when the struggle comes about, you know, you have to embrace that struggle. So struggle is the other thing you have to, you have to get, like you were saying on your, uh, post the other day you have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable because that is where the growth is and yeah. a lot of people don't want to be uncomfortable and and I get that I mean I like you know to relax and you know cuddle with my kid and my dogs and stuff you know that's my idea of comfort but um but then there is no uh joy if if you don't come to the other side of struggle you know you're not finding true joy in your life and satisfaction so yeah. um so big difference say, between fulfillment yeah. and just temporary happiness yeah so struggle um and and being able to persevere through that you know so having perseverance you know um and also taking the whole um, agenda out of it, your ego is, you know, something we all struggle with, you know, um, comparing ourselves to others and going, oh, well, I need to look like that to be somebody, to be mm -hmm. successful. I need to go ride the Grand Prix and, you know, um, hang all the, the 
medals and ribbons up on my door to be somebody, but it, it, but that's not, the other people aren't the judge. The judge is the horse. So to listen to the horse, is the horse liking their work? You know, do you come back and they're like, hey, yeah, I'd like to have this conversation with you, you know? Yeah. Um, that's what you need to check in with, not with what your neighbor's doing. Um, because that's where the value is, you know? And that's why I feel fulfilled in what I'm doing. I'm not worried about going out and uh, achieving all of the, the merits out there because it really doesn't mean anything, you know, at the end yeah. of the day. And, and you, you read these articles about people who've been at the top of the game in the dressage world, and then they hit this level of depression, like yeah. severe level of depression. And my thinking about that is that it's because they're, they've lost what they actually originally went to connect with horses for, which is, is the joy of being of service to this animal to see it have a good life. And that's fulfilling, you know, for me. Well, that, that brings me to the the thing we chatted about a little bit um, before we hit record, which was differentiating yourself between being a dressage trainer and a classical horsemanship trainer. So what mm -hmm. is that distinction for you and why is that important? Well, I think words are powerful and, um, and they can be cheapened. And so for me, um, yes, I practice dressage in, in the traditional format, but I don't put myself out there as a dressage trainer because there's a gazillion of them out there. Um, and I wanted to make the distinction of practicing um, classical horsemanship, which is based on the art of traditional riding and cavalry riding. But overall, horsemanship is about doing what's best for the horse. And sometimes what's best for the horse isn't what you planned, <laughs> yeah. you know? So my whole philosophy is about paying attention to that, you know, and, and that that comes in all facets. It's not just us climbing, swinging a leg over. It's how we care for the horse. It's how we uh, watch their, their life. Like, are, are they happy? Do they have friends? You know, do they feel fulfilled or do they, feel, you know, uh, nervous about their life, you know, and yeah, you sure don't see that in the average dressage training. Uh, program. Right. And I, you know, my horses, I, I mean, I don't have a lot of land, but all of my horses go out every day in their same uh, patterns with their same friends. And, you know, God forbid, if one isn't here, then we have to create a new dynamic. But I, I feel like that's, uh, an important part of caring for horses that they have a social like because they're social animals yeah and when you're taking a horse even and moving it from barn to barn you know um it, a lot of people are doing that because they're not fulfilled at a barn or a barn's not working out for them for some reason or another you know it, that's life but to be aware that you are changing your 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 disuniting that horse from a dynamic possibly with another horse that they've become bonded with. Yeah. And I've seen horses after, you know, 10, 15 years be reunited and they remember each other. You yeah. know, it, it's not a maybe or, oh yeah, coincidental thing. They are very aware. Yeah. And, um, and I think we take that for granted as people of how aware horses are, how sensitive they are to everything we do. And, and I, I, I kind of, you know, when I was pregnant with my daughter, I became very like hypersensitive to energy. I remember <laughs> having a craving for a corn dog and um, I'm like, I have to have a corn dog. It's going to save me right now. So <laughs> I, drove, I drove to the local hamburger place that had corn dogs and I got out of my car and these two men were having some kind of rage against each other, obviously didn't know each other, but upset each other somehow. And they were arguing ferociously. And I got out of my car 
And I just went like, oh, and I burst into tears, you know, and I was just like, I could feel every bit of ugliness. And, and I kind of, in that moment, I went, that's how animals feel. Yeah. All the time. They feel everything. That's how, you, you know, children with autism feel. They yeah. feel, they feel everything coming at them and it's like, oh, you know, it's gotta be overwhelming. So, yeah. Yeah. So we, we really have to uh, be aware of that. You know, our energy is important in how we're handling horses. And um, so their environment, their friendships, the consistency of how we care for them, feed them, um, and that they have a, a life with enrichment, you know, as close to what their nature is as possible, you know. And it makes a big difference for them, you know, and um, and then when we work with them, that what we're bringing to the table, as I just said, is really important and to be responsible for that. And I think that's the part where most people get uncomfortable because they don't want to have to look at themselves to do this uh, hobby. Um, they just want to they want to get on and have fun. You know, I hear that more often. Oh, I just want to enjoy my horse. Right. Oh, okay. well, that's, that's great. But if you're torturing your horse by the way you work with them or sit on them, why is that enjoyable to you? What are you actually getting out of that? Well, that's kind of, um, you know, what you said when you said you have to have a true love for the horse, because everybody that I know says they love their horse. There's nobody I've ever met that's like, yeah, I hate that horse, right? Everybody loves their horse, but do you love him as another being that you respect, or do you love him as a reflection of something you want, like a desire, an object, uh, something? Like How it makes you feel. Exactly. And so if you really mm -hmm. love him, then you're going to do the hard things that are required to be good for him. Right. So yeah. you're one of the few people I know that has actually successfully bridged that gap. Uh, and one of the reasons that I really admire you. Um, I can't remember where I was going with this. So just, 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 all right. yeah, just, <laughs> <laughs> it's just got yeah. excited and started talking. Yeah. Um, but that way I was going to bring me to my second point, which is the differentiation between classical horsemanship and dressage has a problem solving component. That's what led me to my teacher, Teresa, who was also a mm -hmm. nice student. Mm -hmm. um, I've never found that anywhere in the dressage world is problem solving. I also had a very tricky, um, troubled mare that brought me to my teacher before I met you, which is nobody in the dressage world could problem solve. So yeah. like you get on the horse, you ride the horse, you educate the horse, you develop the horse, but what happens if something is wrong and goes wrong? Where, where do you think we lost that along the classical progression? Like what on earth happened? Greed. Yeah. Greed. Industry. Uh, the Veruca salt <laughs> syndrome. <laughs> I wanted to know. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I see people buy horses that have a little character, a little more sensitive, you know, maybe aren't even a real problem horse, but become a problem because of the way they're being written. And guess what happens? They get sold as a jumper, you know, or something. Yeah. yeah. Um, and in fact, I, you know, to my assistant, we've been at shows in the past and I, you know, seen horses going in the ring and person just bought this really nice young horse and they're taking it up the levels and they hit about first level where they have to start getting the horse to push and they're riding backwards against the horse. And the next thing you know, the horse is like, no, because that horse has a little character. Yeah. And people look at that as a bad thing and it's not, it's, it's a opportunity to learn, but most people go, Oh, nope this horse isn't for dressage. Well, let me tell you something. Dressage isn't for the rider. It's for the horse. Right. It's meant to improve each individual horse. And our job as wanting uh, people who want to pursue riding dressage is to learn how to better our, uh, ourselves, but our skill set and learn how to use it in in consciousness with tact and timing so that we can learn to work with any variety of horses. Now, not everybody is going to 
you know, hit that level of writing, but then we have to learn to choose the right circumstances for ourselves, the mm -hmm. right type of horse, level of horse. And, you know, perhaps that horse is better off being a jumper, you know, because, you know, it, it, it less compression, less uh, backwards riding. But, you know, I think riding on all fronts, not just in the dressage world has diminished, you know. Yeah. Years ago, I worked at a dressage, uh, at a, a warm blood breeding barn, and I was super excited to be like involved in that process. And I got to start the young horses and help to break the babies. And I didn't last long at all because I was horrified at, you know, it wasn't like outright abusive, but it was just like, well, this mare tapped out at first level and she's lame now. So we're going to breed her because she needs a job. And, and so yeah. there was just an abundance of lame mares, just stuffed full of babies. So that was their job from then on. And then you had a, a, you know, horse that would be low performing or kind of tricky. And just like you said, be sold off as a jumper or, you know, mm -hmm. this horse is just not going to make it. So, you know, let's call that one. I mean, it was just, it was very clear to me very quickly that it was an industry of mm -hmm. marketability and had nothing to do with the development of a sound and well going horse. It was just marketability and what stallion is going to make this horse have some flash, some pop, you know, to be marketable. Um, and yeah. the jumpers obviously sell for a lot more than the dressage horses. So you really want that flat move. I mean, it just, it, you know, when you see how the sausage is made is the expression, like I became completely uninterested in the competitive world. And yeah. like you said, I lost a lot of credibility as a trainer because I don't have the ribbons and all that stuff, but we're, I don't want to spend all our time complaining, but no, no. where is the industry going? Where do you see the industry going now? Because we have this pretty good rift between, you know, it's people are starting to become aware that they're sick of looking at dressage today magazines with the bloody tongue, the blue tongue and the roll mm. back eyes and stuff. But obviously we still have a strong competition culture. Where are we going from here? Or where do you think we need to go to save our industry? Where do I think we need to go? I think we need to go, uh, we need to market um, the journey of riding and what it brings to the human, you know, yeah. through the process of trying to bring something to the horse. The horse has to like their job. Yeah. They have to like their life. And I think there's a great misunderstanding. People don't understand horses. And in instead of just sitting quietly and watching horses to learn to understand them, now we have uh, people marketing, you know, you have to learn all the anatomy, you have to you be a body worker, you have to, you know, um, buy this instrument and do all these facets to your horse for them to be healthy, but we're getting farther, even in, in the pursuit of trying to do good, we're getting farther away from the horse's nature and from our own nature. Yeah. Which is just to sit and observe, be around yeah. horses, you know, get back to your, your foundation and chill out and watch yeah. and, and learn what horses are saying to you, you know, and I, I realize not everybody has that ability because they haven't spent their life with horses as I have. Um, but I think we're making it too complicated. And I think we need to make it less complicated and we need to spend more time in teaching people how to feel. We're getting away yeah. from feeling anything in our society because everything is like, well, you know, watch Facebook and Instagram for a day and you'll forget about feeling everything because you can just look at cool things. I mean, I do it on, you know, minimal basis, but I do, I do look at read memes or whatever. And, uh, am entertained easily entertained um but i think we have to get back to feeling as a culture and learning to do that in our industry and having compassion you know for another being not just oh you know if i buy all these things that make me feel like i'm doing something oh yeah that's what i really want to talk about thing. right yeah. yeah because there's a lot of that and and people are making a lot of money off of that yeah, you know, and um, there is no quick way to learning to ride. You actually, if you want to be a good rider and you want to be a good horse mom, dad, person, 
um, you you have to you have to, horses like things simple, predictable, and and um, steady. You know, so you have to learn to be that. You know, that's actually, I think one of the biggest problems in the industry right now in the pivoting toward a more like ethical way of going is just like you said, everybody's got every resource at their fingertips, but feel is the hardest skill to teach. And I mean, I, I don't want to be a hip. I have courses online too. Like I'm not a, I'm yeah. not oblivious to the way that the world is working, but yeah. But the marketability of these courses is often like six easy tips to get your horse in perfect posture. And just, you know, it's it's just peddling this almost like this quick dopamine hit, right? Like I bought the course, right. and boom, now I can go watch Netflix, you know? And right. there's no replace. I mean, you spent 22 years after a, already having a lifetime of experience under another teacher who had to, you, you had to refine every skill. I mean, somebody could say, what could you possibly do in 22 years that you couldn't figure out in one? And that's how hard it is. You know what I mean? Like, not that's true. How, yeah, that's not how true. Hard it is. And I always tell my students, it's like, you know, learning is like a layered onion. And you, you just, you keep the things you think, you know, in that one year. Yeah. It, it changes your yeah. perception of it changes your feel an idea and it becomes smaller the world with the horse becomes smaller and more infinite and you start to realize like the things that you're missing you know i learn still every day from a horse i'm like oh you know it, yeah. it, it, it's a whisper you know their energy their nature so you have to you have to you know people like well who cares if my right arm is stiff you know, like the horse should go anyway. Right. Their horse is blocking or something, you know, let's say. And yeah. it's it's throwing the opposite shoulder out is what they don't realize possibly. Right. You know, you have to learn to flow in your own self to flow with a horse. But yeah, the marketability of all of the things out there, it, it, quite honestly, it's, a lot of it's become very mechanical. You know, yeah. your horse should be in this posture. So everybody's riding out their heads, the horse's head up. Never mind what they're feeling under their seat or even understanding that there might be another feeling to feel. Yeah. You know, and you know, I've done a lot of experimenting and messing up in my riding journey through my life. Um, so I've bounced off of a lot of things that I went, oh, well, this must be right or that must be right, and and gone like, oh, nope, I was wrong. And at the bottom of it is learning again to listen to the horse so when they're when they breathe out when and there's certain things that you know are written in all of the old horse books that you look for you know to know if your horse is working correctly mm -hmm. and it it wasn't because they they knew the anatomy or because they you know worked with a you know a clicker or you know they learned to watch and observe and they did uh, you know horrific things to horses hanging them by different you know mechanisms to see where their center of gravity was you know i mean yeah. crazy stuff to figure those things out it's already been done and and uh messed around with you know and um we're just making it more complicated i think you so know. I, I love that you brought up the concept of feel because I have been pursuing that elusive thing. Like it's like this Shangri-La that you like, I'm never going to get there. And I started to realize that it's in little gradients that you develop it like day by day, a little at a time. But I realized, I think it was two years ago, I did a clinic and this, I, I can't remember what the movement was. I think it was a turn on the haunch or something like that. But there was a gal that came up to me who was a trainer and she asked me, at what point in this step, what is the step phase that I should reward for? And I was like, I don't understand the question. And she said, well, I'm a clicker trainer. So at what mm. point in the phase do I reward to teach this posture? And I was like, well, it's, it's not a one posture. It's, it's like a sequence of movement. You're teaching the horse to balance between three movements. So they go from this to that to the other with ease, you know, with, with a nice flow and a nice rhythm. And she's like, I know, but I'm looking for what's the headset and the step phase that I click for. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I don't want to, I don't want to get into the discussion of like positive and negative reinforcement because I don't frankly don't want to be tarred and feathered today, but you like, what? <laughs> 
yeah. where is the feel in that conversation? Because it was just like, no, 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 I'm looking for a black and white answer. And it was like, there yeah. is one. And that's what I see in a lot of these programs that are talking about posture and talking about, and and I love like posture is a fascinating well, topic for me, but like, right. there has to be a feel and a flow to it. Right. Or it just, to me, it just doesn't, it doesn't matter if, you know, it's like, it yeah. And being up and open is is an important posture to be aware of, but yeah. there's more to it than that. And um, I think, you know, I mean, there's different schools of thought, but for me, the hind leg, not by way of running a horse off the feet, but the hind leg has to be connected to the whole yeah. uh, system of energy coming to the hand and the hand yeah. is the receptor and the filter of that. And for different types of horses, I approach that differently. I am not, you know, even though I'm primarily trained in the Austro-Hungarian German classical school, I'm not, you know, I've been around enough different breeds and let's say sausage horses that I've tried to turn into silk purses <laughs> that um, I'm open-minded. So I think the more experienced of a trainer you become and teacher you become, you become more open-minded about how to approach different types of horses. Yeah. And so it's not that I think, oh, the German school's only right or the French school's only right. I think for different circumstances, you can you can work with both, but you have to have a foundation in one of those things really well. And even I think I was reading or listening to B Patina Drummond talking about um, Nuno Oliver and how he even knew for certain types of horses that the German school was better for that type of horse, you know? So, you know, the great masters even, you know, they, they talked about themselves, about the different styles in which they were bringing to their training and how this affected this or that affected that and how it worked, but it all came from a feeling place. Yeah. Not, not, well, I want him to look like this or that. It was about function. And, yeah. and so I always talk about physics because physics is nature, you know, and that's something nobody can argue with. Yeah. I mean, sure. You can, you can uh, try to argue it and, and put out some, uh, crazy statements like, oh no, there's no such thing as gravity. You know, come on. <laughs> but, uh, so it, it really comes down to physics and where energy flows and understanding that through yourself, through the horse's body, if you want to mm -hmm. be practical about it, but you have to feel energy and understand how to hone it. Like any great martial artist, you know, understand, they understand how to build power within themselves and release power either gently or forcefully you know, and there's no, uh, you only do this or you only do that. You have to learn how to respond to each moment and you need a good set of eyes on the ground, the two, yeah. legged team, not just the horse, but you need, you need somebody who can say, Hey, this is what I'm seeing. What are you feeling in that moment? Okay. This is what I would do. Or, you know, I think that's really important. You know, and what you see, a lot of is you see people bouncing from one clinic to the next clinic, to this method, to that method. And then they're trying to create this patchwork of different information and create their own thing. But what they end up doing is just being really confused and muddled and yeah. really not, not progressing. They might have a lot of information stored in their brain, but they're not actually progressing as riders because they haven't stuck to anything long enough to have a, a foundation, you know, and yeah. for me, the foundation is the hardest and most important thing um, that any rider has to be good at. I would rather understand the foundation really, really well than climb on some horse and do a bunch of one tempies and he often not have an, a clue of how I got there. Well, that's something I was going to ask you about too, is now if you look at the, you know, if you look at the people who are uh, getting attention. I don't know how to put it more PC than that. People who are big figures in the horse world, their information, their, their claims to fame are always these big things. Like here's me pee offing. Here's me levotting. Here's a Spanish walk. Here's me doing a sliding stop bridalist and bareback. But you rarely see these people put out like a clear four beat walk or 
here's an excellent transition or here's a circle, right? <laughs> like, here's a good circle with good contact or here is mm-hmm. my horse calmly leading next to me. It's always these kissy face pictures. And it's, it's like, it's blown out into this like Hallmark, vi- um, you know, these ha- Hallmark romance movies almost. Uh, and mm-hmm. so it's almost like the public does not recognize good basics. So how do you recognize good basics? Well, because number one, it's it's not flashy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, if you watch some of the videos from the um, Von Neindorf Institute and their performances, there's a movie by uh, Roland Bloom and it's called The School of Classical Horsemanship. And it, you know, it romanticizes the whole school and everything, it, but it's quite beautiful to watch. And, yeah. And, interesting um but when you watch the horses go it's you it's not anything close to the flash you see out in the world of sport riding yeah um but being that i was able to visit the riding school through melissa and and work with some of those horses with with melissa i can definitely say that i've never felt anything so soft and flowing and breathless uh, in my life other than what I've experienced through what I've learned from Melissa, but it, what it did is it gave me, oh, that's where I'm going. Even a little, little more, um, of an idea at that time in my riding. Yeah. Um, but you don't see that in, in the riding world. You know, what you're seeing is a lot of hyper, uh, movement and, um, something that doesn't even look like um, the yesteryears of dressage because people think that well the it, times have changed you know our horses are more athletic all of that but right. even those horses can benefit from from learning to use their bodies correctly and when I say correctly I mean that they're upright on a single hoof track that they're not leaning on this shoulder and that shoulder I mean if you're if you're educated and you watch these horses as flashy as it looks to somebody who isn't understanding what they're watching it, what you see in like a, a pee for example is the shoulders doing this the pee off mm-hmm. side to side and you don't see the folding of the limbs a pee is merely an exercise that elaborates throughness and once you get there it shouldn't be it shouldn't be this this struggle or forceful thing it should just be like you know the horse coming up to your hand you know mm-hmm. and and true and and i don't think people understand what contact or the connection they have in the reins and true contact is in the reins. Yeah. They don't understand what on the bit is, which is not you holding a horse, somebody, but, but the horse creating an environment so that, and, and um, mechanisms that the horse learns to flow to your hand and take connection with the bit and have the desire to chew the bit from the rider's mm-hmm. hand at any point, because this opens the back. But everything has become so sensationalized, like that, yeah. that those little feelings, like those little, yeah. they're subtle to us now because we're used to these big explosive things, but they're like, yeah. you said it was breathless, weightless, so soft. Right. But like mm-hmm. when you teach people, they're looking for the horse to like drop down and sleep or do a cartwheel backward because it's so happy or kiss you on the lips and thank you and drop to his knees. You know what I mean? Like these little yeah. subtle things you have to really, you have to really look for those if you're used to bigger things that are incorrect, yeah. you know? Well, and I think people really just need to learn how to, I mean, they don't know how to sit on horses. Why yeah. do you, you know, they don't know how to sit a trot. Right. And it's, it's because they've had these you know, now we've developed saddles with such huge knee rolls and, um, you know, the bridles have become more, you know, fitted to the horse to help prevent pressure on the pull or now we're padding nose bands and, you know, all of that stuff is a result of humans not being responsible for their own riding journey and, and learning in a way that, helps the horse find harmony with them not it it shouldn't be a wrestling match right you know yeah sure there's a time you might have to pull on the reins if the horse is doing something but that you always go back to neutral you always go back to the flow and yeah riding today it's it's you know it's a representation of our society honestly so um again it's it's about 
humans coming back to like their nature. And I think people don't realize that they actually need that. Yeah. Because they're so far out there on that tether looking for things that satisfy them quickly and make them feel good. You know, that's why merchandise is so, you know, you know, pink pads with a matching polos and, you know, (laughs) whatever, you know, people are really into that stuff and, you know, no harm, no foul, but it's, it's, again, it's just a, uh, it's a representation of our, um, our values in society. So how we get back there, I'm not sure. I've asked myself that question. How do we get back to what's important? Um, I think it's going to burn itself out at some point. I mean, we are already seeing things getting uncovered with abuses and people are shocked, you know, that their favorite rider has done something so atrocious or whatever. Um, And I, uh, you know, for me, I, 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 the only statement I have is like, why are you, are you really surprised? Are you just surprised that it's a problem? Right. Because it it happened. I mean, and what people don't realize is that even if you're well-intended, if you um, haven't bettered yourself to a point of being a good passenger on the horse's back, where you don't interfere with them, or, you know, you're not clutching to get your balance, even that is an abuse on a horse's back, you know, and it's like every, so that's why, you know, school horses are angels, because they have to put up with all of that stuff. But when people are properly taught, Um, they're taught to, uh, have a seat first. You know, when I was a kid coming up and learning to jump, you know, we learned to jump without stirrups, without our hands. We went through shoots, you know, you had to do two point, all of these things. And then people really, um, wanting to like, you know, bring these kids or adults through their program quickly and make more money, you know started going, oh, well, you know, you can jump already. You, you, two, two points good enough. I mean, I got kids, when, you know, in my earlier years of teaching, I would get kids who were jumping and they couldn't ride a proper two point, yeah. you know, or go walk trot canter and they were already jumping. And I'm like, no. Oh yeah. You know, when I taught can't. kids, I had tons of kids who couldn't sit the trot, post the trot or canter and they were jumping. Yeah. And I mean, that's, it's relying on the horse is, uh, you know, um, good manners and and ability to carry you through that when you're in their way you know so you know you see you see on some of those um sites on facebook you know uh whatever they call it the shit dressage riders or shit jumpers unite yeah yeah. i'm not really sure what it's called but (laughs) you know where people are coming out of fence and you're like oh you know they're gonna eat that fence you can already see it but they don't know that and yeah, that's a problem. That's really dangerous. Yeah. You know? And and when you hear about Olympic riders having accidents, you know, in the walk. Yeah. Falling down in the walk. Like they don't know why. You know, it's just, oh, the horse tripped or something. Because like the things that were already drawn out, if you read any good classic book, you know, nose in front of the vertical, you know, horse seeking the bit is for a reason. The the neck is the balancing rod of the horse. When we take that away, you know, the horse can't put their feet where they need to put them. The The front foot's going to land where the nose points. So right. if the nose is behind the vertical, guess what you're doing? You're stabbing that toe into the ground. So of course the horse is going to fall down in the walk or right. not know how to carry itself because you've taken away its balance. You haven't yeah. taught it to use its neck muscles and, and reach forward. If you that's why like, you know, if you have a horse on the ground and you take its head to the side, its body goes away because it's got to get back behind its neck. Mm-hmm. Any, any good cult starter is going to know that one. Right. Right. So, um, yeah, so we don't know just the basic stuff out there. And, and so as an educator, that's what I'm trying to bring to light in the, any way I can, you know, I'm not on social media a lot. I don't, you know, I probably should be, but, you know, I'm busy riding, you know, I'm doing, <laughs> I did 12 horses yesterday, my, in my fifties, you know, that's a lot of working with horses and, and I have an assistant too. So, so it's hard for me to do more than I am, but I would like to, you know, yeah. like to put the word out. 
And I know there's other people out there trying to do that as yourself. So, right. well, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm just a blabber mouth. I don't have the experience that you have. So I'll do the blabbering and well, you can, yeah, but you, I feel like what you're saying out there is it's all relevant, you know, and, and it comes from a humble place. So that's where we have to start. I think people have to get um, to the place where they're, they can accept that. Okay. Well, I don't know something. Yeah. You know, and I'd like to learn a little something more. I mean, I'm, I've been doing this my whole life, you know, and um, I've been teaching for almost 40 years, you know, since I was a kid. And um, I am, I feel like there's still so much to learn out there. And I don't feel like I'll ever be done learning. You know, I like yeah. that. I, I, sometimes you see that saying where, you know, there, oh, it was the cellist. And he's like, you know, they asked him famous cellist and, oh, well, why do you still practice? And he goes, I think I'm getting better now because <laughs> <laughs> he, he was still like, no, I, he could still see the, you, you have to be that person. You have to be the person that's like, no, there's always room to grow. Yeah. There's always a way to get better. And, and it's fulfilling because when you see your horse happy to see you and you can get on and have a peaceful ride that flows, even if it's just sitting on him in a trot and you get this nice trot under you and the horse wanting to take the bit and reach for the bridle and, and the availability of the energy from the hind leg, even if you just, that's a big deal. It's not, it's not a just, it's, it's a big deal to have pure gates oh, under sure. you. Well, you know, before I found my teacher, I was riding higher level stuff. Like I had been riding mm -hmm. a Grand Prix school horse and I had been futzing around and I was pretty proud of myself. And when I started riding with her, she was like, everything is everything needs to be started over. And so for 10 years of intense instruction, that's what I have to show now is that I can sometimes sit the walk and trot and feel that sense of peace. And like, sometimes I get frustrated that I don't have anything cool to show. Like I used to have cool yeah. stuff and now I don't, now I don't have any canter pirouettes. I have no lavades. I have no, but I do have a horse that is starting to like me. And that's that addictive feeling that like, I've had my ass kicked yeah. for 10 years about how I sit, how I hold the reins, how I do everything. And the result is that my horse and I have some form of harmony and it's not exciting to look at, but it feels so good. And that's, exactly. that's worth something, you know, that's really worth something. So, yeah. Yeah. And you, you were talking about on one of your posts, the foundation and um, how maybe finding a teacher that isn't flashy, but perhaps can teach you the substance of riding yeah. and how that was important to recognize. And yeah. I think I added of like, however, the foundation is the hardest part to learn correctly. It's the oh, hardest yeah. part to learn, but it's easy to understand. And I think yeah. that's how we ident need to identify what's right and wrong in in our learning processes and what we're receiving from a teacher is if people are making things so convoluted and so mysterious it's not obtainable or understandable even if you can't do it yeah you know um that's excellent yeah it's it's really as a student for for all my life but also as a teacher i try to make things understandable so that i can draw a conclusion to the right feelings and give the person the right chain of events through their technique of how they're going to facilitate that. Yeah. And I find that there's so many teachers out there who are, are, you know, perhaps they're really good at riding and, and they are, you know, magical, but they're not good at teaching what they're doing because it, it takes a lot of effort, you know, and it takes a lot of thought and introspection as a person as well yeah. to be a teacher. How am I, it's not, you know, riding is an art. Everything with the horses is an art can be an art and teaching is an art. Yeah. And uh, for me, that's been to be a very good student first. And then the next step is to become a very good teacher of whatever it is, you know, so, yeah. and and it doesn't mean that it's easy for the student to get there, but they at least understand what they're striving for and that they can chip away at it slowly, you know? Yeah. And we have to, as students, become satisfied with little morsels of like, oh, I had a moment where that felt good. And maybe yeah. the rest wasn't so great, but 
that's where we're going to stop right there on that moment. You know, I, I figured something out. Let's stop. And then you have to very carefully build on that, you know, and it's so, the same with horses. If they have like, you know, if they've had abuses in their life and you're trying to gain their trust and build a new, you have to be happy with very little, um, small, um, small rewards, you know, small, um, victories with the horse as well. Yeah. I think that in, in my experience as a teacher, I've gotten a lot of students that fall into two camps, which is the very competitive high level student who knows very mm -hmm. little about simple biomechanics or simple, like, like if you said, where's the right front foot, they'd be like, huh? You know, so they're like jumping six foot or competing at pre-St. George, but they've never thought about the mechanics of movement. It's like training to the test. Mm -hmm. And then, then there's a lot of the amateurs that know a lot about posture. They know a lot about anatomy. They know a lot about saddle fitting. They know a lot about tack fitting, the facial nerves, but they don't like know how to post on the right diagonal or, you know, how to funnel the horse. Yeah. Basics of riding, it seems like are just kind of where, who's teaching them. Right. So why yeah. do you need to learn about the facial nerves before you need to learn about how to sit? You know what I mean? Right. Well, and Melissa, I don't, I don't remember the quote, but I, I had posted it some time ago and she was being in an interview and she was talking about how theory and practice go hand in hand, but what theory without practice is not a value and practice without theory you know it is actually more important but you need both yeah you know it's not a black and white thing but I would rather spend my hours talking and listening to a horse and asking them how they feel about the situation as opposed to reading about you know where their nerves go you know yeah. and we are, you know we already have basic fundamental um rules of thumb as far as like how nose bands fit and um where the saddle should go and and things such as that that help us uh do no harm but yeah. well somehow they need the science behind it to believe it yeah and um you know the old dead guys they they didn't they weren't scientists you know they were artists and um and they they learned all of this through through learning the art of of riding you know well that brings up an interesting point because you always see those dissections going around on facebook that it's like somebody holding up like a horse head and neck on a cadaver mm -hmm. and they're yeah. like well you know they're they're manipulating it the horse head and neck and they're like see this proves through science that the horse's head should never go below this level or whatever you know and you yeah. have like, people who are doing science mm -hmm in a clinical setting with a dead horse who's not in movement versus an actual rider riding in movement. Exactly. You know, like, so they're not the same. It's not the same. And, um, you know, for example, people are always really, you know, there's so much controversy over um, what they call stretching. You know, some people are like, the horses don't stretch, you know, yeah. that's not stretch. Okay, whatever you want to call it, the horse seeking the bit, opening mm -hmm. its neck, to the bit having yeah. the desire to hold the bit right is the first step and then they have to learn to actually want to take the bit from you mm -hmm. so that when you drive the hind leg through this brings the head and neck up but mm -hmm. if you're just bringing the the neck up there's no then the legs are just moving under the horse there's no connection throughout the whole muscular skeletal system of the horse so yeah, when the motion part, what you were talking about, that they're showing these anatomical things, you know, moving them mechanically and see, this is why the horse needs, but they're forgetting about the, the physics of it. Right. When something's in motion, there's two ends to that, right. you know, and I always <laughs> equate it to like a, a teeter totter, you know, yeah. they show the back coming up and then this part lowers and this part comes up. So there's the physics in it. And and it's at the velocity in which we travel, you know, Th that's why the tempo is the most important thing in your training. And for different styles of horses, you have to have a different consideration for the tempo. You know, it's not just forward, 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 run the horse off their feet. You right. have to find a tempo in which the horse can relax and where you feel like you can relax your hand and the horse is staying under you. 
you yeah. know, for a thoroughbred, I'm not going to just ride them forward off their feet. They will never relax because right. they are built to be on their forehand. They're gallopers, right. you know, right. you have to slow them down and teach them to pull the bit out. And then you can start to create the swing under you by getting the hind leg to take longer steps slowly. You have to well, stretch it back to slowly. Yeah, it's not a nuance and feel. Right forward, they'll eventually stretch that. They won't because you're they're not in balance. You know, so different types of horses take different considerations. And again, that comes to experience and feel, you know. And uh, Melissa used to say, you know, it it takes it at least 10 years to train a rider to ride on a school horse. And then it takes another 10 years to teach them to train one horse. And it takes at least 10 horses for them to <laughs> to ruin before they really understand how to train that one horse, you know, that's extreme, but it, it was an interesting thought because I'm like, yeah, actually you do, you need to mess up a lot, mm -hmm. but, um, we try to do as little harm as possible in our journey of messing up if possible. But I always ask myself, like, how does a person come to classical horsemanship or to wanting to do what I've been doing? And I think they, for some people, they have to have hit rock bottom. They have to have tried all the different facets. And then that's the only time that they're really able to see something different. Mm -hmm. Because they've already tried all the other stuff and maybe perhaps it's not working any longer. But, you know, um, you know, I don't know. It, it's a, it's a, it's a tricky question. It's a sticky one. Yeah. So as a wrapping up thought, mm -hmm. and this might be a hard one to answer. I don't know. Mm -hmm. What would you say is like a non-negotiable list for a student to actually like, what, what does a student need to become? You called it impeccable in the writing. Most of us are not going to become impeccable. We're going to become less offensive, but if you yeah. want to become <laughs> like the least offensive possible writer that you can be, yeah. What is a non-negotiable list of things a student has to do to get there? Mm, For us mere mortals, what do we need to do? Well, first off, you have, you have to learn to uh, be a horseman, which is more than just riding. You have to learn that being involved with horses has to do with overall horsemanship, not just showing up and swinging a leg over. You know, it has to do with how your horse is managed in the barn, being aware of all of those nuances and how you handle a horse, grooming, all of that. Um, and you need to educate yourself as best you can through all of that. Um, find yourself a good two-legged teacher and stick with them. You know, find somebody who has a, a, a philosophy of, of, the horse's well-being in mind at all times, you know, and I'm not, you know, a good horseman is a good horseman. I've met good horsemen in all disciplines, you know, and so for me, they really all come to the same ideas of, of doing no harm and, and letting the horse be a horse under you and learning how to go with that. Um, and you have to put the hours in, you know, um, if you just want to be a, a uh, you know, I don't consider myself an impeccable rider, but I'm a really good horse woman and a good rider, a wear rider. And I don't think you're ever done learning that. So you have to, you have to find um, within yourself the desire to do that. And, um, and even if you just want to be on the trail, enjoying nature, you, your horse deserves to have a, a, a rider who can, who can handle themselves in a way to, that helps take care of the horse on the trail because trail riding is dangerous as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, equitation, everybody needs to have a certain level of equitation and it's not because of how you look, but it's how you function and balance on the horse that you don't rely on your hands to balance you is a really mm -hmm. important thing and that you learn technique, you know, a technique that works with the horse's nature, not against the horse's nature. Um, 
that you're not hanging on their mouth and sawing their mouth, that you're allowing the horse to move and you're learning a technique in which you can have a conversation with them instead of forcing them. So anytime uh, force is involved, that's where, you know, your knowledge has ended, you know, and that's where you need to put the reins down and climb off. When mm -hmm. you start thinking force is the way, that's when you need to stop riding at that point and get, find somebody to help you. Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, beyond that, you know, you're an athlete, just like your horse. So you have to, as a rider, you have to learn to take pressure and you have to learn to be uncomfortable. And, um, a lot of people in riding, they think it, it, you know, it's really cool when they start working with me. And then when the pressure comes on of known, actually, you know, you've got to work hard, you've got to sweat. Yeah. <laughs> you've got to become stronger so that you're a better functioning human on the horse's back. Uh, people uh go oh this is work i don't know if i want to do this yeah well, you're expecting the horse to work under you you're expecting them to carry you around then you need to be a really good passenger you mm -hmm. know so quotation across the board for any discipline is really really important and having good balance and awareness um and then you know the mental aspects um that you come to the horse with the right attitude you know, if you've had a bad work day and you're stressed, your horse is not your therapist. You know, don't go there to expel your 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 bad energy on the horse and have them absorb that. You know, you have to be responsible for what you bring into the stable. And so I talk to people about that a lot. It's like, okay, if, you know, we're all human, we're not perfect. Nobody is perfect. So we have to learn to be aware, like, hey, Maybe today's not a good day. I'm feeling really tired. Maybe today's not a good day for me to, maybe I'll just groom my horse, you know? I, so being responsible for yourself, that is, I think, a cornerstone uh, of being a good horse person and rider. Um, and beyond that, you know, um, be willing to go on a journey because that's what um, horsemanship is. It's a journey of learning. We could summarize it all with self responsibility, probably. Yeah, yeah, for for sure. So well, that would take a huge societal change, but here's hoping. <laughs> <laughs> we hold just we just keep one light on, and we you know we slowly gather people who want to do that. You know that's the hope. Well, there's that's so much good. I have like four pages of notes from everything you said, but that's a lot of really good stuff. So I really. Really appreciate your time. Um, I can't wait to share this one. This one's really good. Oh, cool. Thank you for having me. Yeah, well, I'm gonna, I don't have any like words of wisdom to wrap it up with. That's your department, but you already did it for like an hour and 10 minutes. So <laughs> I, I think the only words of wisdom in horsemanship is um, do everything you do, do it in the name of, you know, the love for the horse, you know? And, uh, and in, in, return, in return, you're going to feel better with yourself as well. So perfect gem. There you go. We have our All right. golden Amy. nugget. Thank you so much for being with me. <laughs> All right. You're welcome. Have a Talk great rest you. of your day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay,